Take your Bibles with me today and turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Well, we are coming to an end of our study of the Sermon on the Mounts. Since January, remember we started clear back in January where Pastor Brad stood up and quoted the Sermon on the Mount. Remember that? And uh, this has been uh, what I think is a revolutionary study. It's been very practical. It's been helpful for us. It's been helpful for me. And we've seen, remember we've gone through and Jesus talks in the Sermon on the Mount about issues that, 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 that relate with all of our lives. Jesus has talked about darkness and lies and selfishness and sex and anger and weak, uh, worry and hate and revenge and all of those things Jesus has talked about. And he's talked about how um, our lives should change from, from those things in our lives to light and uh, um, truth and selflessness and purity and faith and love and sacrifice and confession. Instead of these characteristics being in our life, these characteristics should be actively displayed in our lives. And I trust that they are in your life. I trust that this series has revolutionized your life. I trust that it's revolutionized the way that you think. I trust that it's revolutionized the way that you act. I trust that it's revolutionized the way that you respond, that God's Word literally has flipped us upside down. That's the name of the series, Flipped. As we, as, as we see the way we live, we compare that to God's Word, and God's Word changes us and molds us and shapes us into Him's image. I, I confess, my life has been flipped upside down through this series, and I trust that yours has been changed as well. Well, today as we come to the end, and we're not finishing today, we'll actually look at the last few verses next week. Dr. Mike Hill will be speaking. It's our back to school Sunday and he'll be speaking and he'll be taking the last few verses of this chapter. But, but we basically look at, at the last teaching of Jesus in verses 24 through 27. And you'll find that in these verses, Jesus doesn't give us new information. And he's already loaded us down with a lot of information. It seems like every week he was teaching us a new principle. He was giving us a new teaching, something that we can and should apply to our lives. But in this passage, Jesus doesn't give us new information. But rather, he gives us a caution. He gives us a warning about not ignoring the words that he has just spoken. In other words, he says, okay, all these things that I've said to you, you've, you've heard them, you've probably thought about them, maybe you've meditated on them. Now he ends this sermon by giving a caution, saying, don't just be hearers of my word, but now be doers of my word. Don't just understand the things that I say, but put the things that I say into practice. So notice Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24. Jesus says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came. And the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because he had founded it on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mind, but doesn't do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and the house fell. And great was the fall of it. Would you pray with me today? Lord, man, we've been able to do a lot of things today. And Lord, maybe even most importantly, we've been able to meet together. We've been able to meet with you. Thank you that you promise us that when there's a handful of people there, that you are in their midst. And today we rejoice that we're not only meeting together with the church, but we're meeting with the leader of the church, the head of the church. Thank you that you're here with us today. Help us to sense your presence. 
And Lord, as we study these, your words, help us to understand them. But more than understand them, help us to apply them to our lives. May our lives truly be changed by the message of the gospel. Help us to build our lives on a solid foundation. Help us to be ready for the storms of life. So thank you for what you're going to teach us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In in this passage, Jesus speaks in the form of a parable. I'm sure you're familiar with the parable. A parable is a simple, earthly story with a moral or a spiritual lesson. The New Testament is filled with parables. You're familiar with many of them. The the parable of the sower, the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan. There are some 40 parables in the New Testament that Jesus uses. He takes this heavenly principle and he applies it in an earthly way so that you and I can understand it. In each of those parabolic stories, Jesus uses, as I mentioned, this practical, earthly illustration to teach us spiritual truth. And he does the same thing in the parable that we're looking at today. In today's parable, Jesus actually, though, calls his audience to make a decision. As he was speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees and the spiritual leaders after he had just given all of this teaching. And remember, you know, we've gone through this teaching uh, for six, seven months. Jesus taught all of this at one time. He was standing on a hillside and his listeners were listening to him and he taught this entire parable at one time. And so as he comes to the conclusion of, or excuse me, this entire sermon at one time. So as he comes to the conclusion of the sermon, he now calls for his listeners to make a decision. And the decision for them was this, on whom or on what would they build their life? And so I would say today that uh, in the same way, just like Jesus' original listeners, you and I today are called to make a decision. And in one way or another, we're going to leave here today making a decision. We will either leave here making the decision to trust in Jesus and to put his words and, uh, uh, into practice in our life, or we might leave here today making the decision, you know what, that was all well and good, I just don't think that's for me. One way or another, we are going to make a decision. Will we trust in Jesus, or will, quite frankly, will we trust in ourselves? Will we be like the Pharisees of Jesus' day and play at religion? Or will we truly become dedicated followers of Jesus Christ? Will we allow Jesus to produce in us what only he can produce for his honor and for his glory? So if you're following along in your outline today, two simple points. There's the explanation of the parable and then the application of of the parable. So notice, first of all, the, the explanation of the parable. And notice verse 24 and verse 26 again. Verse 24, Jesus says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does not do them will, like, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. In contrast, verse 26, those who hear these words and don't do them will be like the unwise man who built his house on the sand. Now you might read this and say, Boy, sure sounds like Jesus is getting into the house building business. But you know as well as I do that here, Jesus is not instructing us how we should build our physical homes. He's not looking at Brian and you and saying, now when you construct your house, let me give you a couple of architectural ideas how you should construct your house. He's not talking about a physical building. No, the building of the house in this passage is comparable to the building of one's spiritual life. So Jesus is talking about the fact that that Brian is in the process of of seeing his spiritual life built. And you are in the process of seeing your spiritual life built. The simple truth is this, that all of us are under construction. We've said that over and over again. All of us could have a great big sign on our chest that simply says this, please excuse me, I am under construction, all right? I'm under construction and you are under construction whether you realize it or not. You were in the process of building your spiritual house. You were in the process, obviously, allowing God to build your spiritual life question for me though and the question for you is this what type of house 
are we constructing? Are we allowing God to construct, to build a house that will survive the storms of life? Or are we building a house that whenever problems come and whenever temptations come and whenever trials come, our spiritual house will fall and as Jesus says in the passage, great will be the ruin of it. Notice in the passage, Jesus mentions two houses that were built. And I want you to see that these houses were built in a similar way. Look, let's kind of dissect the passage a little bit because both these houses, though different, were built in the exact same way. Let me tell you what I mean by that. First of all, both builders had heard the message of the gospel. In verse 24 and verse 26. Verse 24, he talks about the wise builder. Verse 26, he talks about the unwise builder. But both of those verses begin the exact same way. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine. So listen, here's what Jesus is not doing. Jesus is not comparing those who live in the United States, us, who have access to the gospel and hear the gospel all the time with those who live in another country who have never heard the gospel. That's not the comparison that he's making. Jesus is speaking to religious people. Jesus is speaking to us. Hey, hey, first of all, here's what we need to understand, and I want you to catch this. Hearing the gospel is not enough. Catch that. Hearing the gospel is not enough. Understanding the gospel is not enough. You can hear the message of Jesus. You can even understand the message of Jesus and still build your life on the wrong foundation. That's what Jesus is saying in the passage. Both builders heard the message of the gospel. Notice there's a, there's a second thing. Both builders built their houses in the same general location. You say, Brian, how do you know that? First of all, this is a parable. How do you know that they built their houses in the same general location? Well, they were both hit by the same storm. All right, so both these guys were building these houses which represent represent their spiritual lives, and they both experienced, they both went through what? The same storm. What does that mean? How do we apply that to our lives? In other words, the, the outward circumstances of their lives were the same. One did not have any more advantage over the other. They probably lived in the same town. They probably attended the same church. They probably heard the same message. They they were basically the same type of people. This is so basic, but I want you to catch this because I think some people are disillusioned by this. Being born in the United States does not make you a Christian. Attending Hollywood Community Church week after week does not make you a disciple. Don't misunderstand. I am grateful to be a citizen of the United States of America. I'm sure you are as well. I'm thrilled that I'm a part and you're a part of Hollywood Community Church and we want you to be here Sunday after Sunday. But the simple fact that you're an American, the simple fact that you attend here week after week does not make you a disciple of Jesus Christ. And Jesus makes that distinction in the passage. There's a third thing that, that's indicated in the passage. Both builders built houses that had the same appearance. Outwardly, their spiritual houses from, were very much alike. From all appearances, the foolish man lived and looked just like the wise man. One didn't look any more righteous. One didn't look any more spiritual. One didn't look any more holy than the other. They had the same spiritual appearance. From the outside, externally, they look like the exact same house. So as I read that, I thought, wow, these two guys symbolized by the spiritual house that they are building. These two guys seem very much alike. They kind of look like spiritual twins. 
It's kind of like I think most of you know that I have an identical twin Bruce. It's kind of like having Bruce and Brian up here. Other than the fact that, you know, um, I carry just a little bit more weight on me than Bruce does. Solid muscle compared to him. But other than that, we are, you know, that's not true. But anyways, uh, um, other than that, we're alike. You'd look and say, my word, they look like the same person. You'd look at these two people that Jesus is describing, and you would say, Man, they are so much alike. They look alike. They talk alike. They dress alike. They act alike. They respond alike. Why, both of them are solid believers. Both of them are solid Christians. But there was one significant difference. And Jesus outlines the difference. The difference is this. Their houses were built on different foundations. Externally, they looked the same. But one man built his house on the rock, and the other man built his house on the sand. Now, you don't have to be a geologist. You don't have to be an architect today to know that there is a huge difference between constructing upon rock and constructing upon sand. Sand. It's interesting, the terms that Jesus used are very interesting. The word rock here doesn't mean just a stone or a boulder. The word that Jesus used uh, describes a great outcropping of rock, a large expanse of bedrock, something that is incredibly solid. So he say, here's one man who, who builds this beautiful house, the wise man, and he builds it on bedrock. It's solid. But here's somebody else who builds seemingly the exact same house. And instead of building it upon rock, he builds it on sand. Now you know there's a huge difference between rock and sand, right? Rock is solid, it is sturdy, it is unmovable. Sand is soft, it's shifty, it is unstable. And so Jesus said, here's these two guys, seemingly spiritual, seemingly religious, For the most part, identical. Externally, you can't tell a difference. But there is a difference. The difference is not external. The difference is internal. One built his house on the rock, and the other built his house on the sand. Now notice, Jesus clarifies what he means in the passage, and it's in your notes. Jesus says the house built on the rock represents the man who heard the words of Jesus and obeyed them. The text of the ESV actually says he does them. The word does is a, is a really simple word. It's not a complex word. It's a simple word that is used repeatedly in the New Testament some 500 times. It carries the idea of doing something, making something, or accomplishing something. And Jesus said, here's the wise man who not only hears my words, but he what? He responds to my words. Through God's grace and God's empowerment, he takes my words and he, he puts them into practice. And Jesus calls him a wise man. There's a contrast. The house built on sand represents the man who heard the words of Jesus, heard the exact same message, more than likely understood the message. The difference was he disobeyed them. He did not do, negatively, he did not do what Jesus had told him to do. You see, the big difference is that one built his life using divine specifications, as it were, and the other man built his life using his own specifications. The one man is described as wise, and the other man is described as foolish. By the way, the word foolish here in this passage is one of the strongest words in the New Testament. And it's used not to describe somebody who, you know, completely rejects God. As the psalmist said, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But he takes this word fool or foolish, and he describes the person who hears the words of God, understands them, and then decides to live as he or she wants to live. They're foolish. Here's what the word foolish means in the passage. 
It means a person who is deprived of the ability to understand. We would use, not a politically correct word, but we would use the word either slow or retarded. Person, some person who is, does not have the ability to reason for themselves. They hear the word of God, but for some reason, they do not put it into practice in their life. And Jesus said that person is not a wise person. That person is a foolish person. The explanation of the parable. So follow me for just a moment. Not only do we explain the parable today, but, but we apply the parable. So here, some, some 2,000 years removed from Jesus standing up and preaching the Sermon on the Mount there on that hillside, how does this apply to us? You and I live in a completely different day and age. Uh, you and I live in a completely different culture. We're speaking a completely different language. How does these verses, how do these verses apply to us here in 2016 at Hollywood Community Church? Let me give you three applications that, that I promise is going to resonate with where you are today. The first application is this. Every person will go through storms that will test the foundation of their faith. Let me say that again. Every single person will go through storms that will test the very foundation of their faith. We see that all through Scripture. Look at some of the Bible's greatest heroes. Their faith was tested. Job, one of the most pious Holy man in the Bible. And one day lost his family, his wealth, and his health. Abraham, who believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, was asked to prove whether he loved God more than he loved his own son. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery. L Ruth lost her husband and had to live in a foreign land. David was anointed as the future king of Israel, and yet after that anointing, the present king Saul began to chase after him and pursue him and try to kill him. And for years, David, God's anointed, was on the run for his life. Hosea, God's prophet, ministered while having a wife who was unfaithful to him. The apostle Paul was beaten stoned and left for dead. Yeah, even the great Bible characters went through tremendous storms. Now listen, such difficulties do not just occur in the Bible. They happen today as well. You don't have to attend Hollywood Community Church very long to hear of our faithful members who have endured difficult storms. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? Amy Rittering lost her husband to a terrorist attack seven months ago. What a storm. Tim Elton, one of our beloved guys in our congregation, after surviving stomach cancer, has repeated episodes of syncope, fainting, which doctors cannot diagnose. Since January, Tim's been in the hospital, I think, 24 times. The doctors have looked and said, man, we're struggling with diagnosing what you're going through. Many of you have lost family members. Even in recent months, listen, church, get this. The simple truth is this. You will go through a storm in your life that will put your faith to the test. It doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been a believer. Your faith will be tested. It was Adrian Rogers who said this, a faith that has not been tested cannot be trusted. And God allows us 
to go through situations which test our faith. You ever been through one of those? I'm not talking about just a little trial. I'm not talking about just a little hiccup in your life. I'm talking about a ground-shaking, earth-shattering experience in your life that shakes you to the very core and causes you to examine, do I really believe what I say I believe? Have you ever experienced that? Vicki and I had been in Mexico City for seven years. Most of you know we were missionaries there for, for 10 years. Planned on spending the rest of our lives there. My twin brother Bruce and his family were joining us. I mean, just a, God was blessing our ministry there more than I can begin to explain. When all of a sudden, little Amber was born. First 30 days, we had no idea whether Amber was going to make it. I won't get into the entire story. It was difficult. I'd been a pastor for years. I was a missionary who left my home, left my country, was starting a church. I have to tell you, that shook my faith. I didn't turn my back on God, but there were times that I cried out to God and say, God, I don't understand. I don't understand, how in the world can you treat me this way? You ever been there? And by the way, we don't, uh, we don't deserve to be treated anyway. But to sit back and say, God, I don't understand what you are doing. That was a ground-shaking experience, and I can tell you it was only by the grace of God, and it was only by the strength of the Holy Spirit and His Word that we were able to get through that moment, and we still get through that moment in our life. Listen, maybe you've experienced somewhat something even more difficult than that, but I'm here to tell you today, there will come a time in your life in which the faith that you claim to possess will be put to the test. Jesus says it this way in John chapter 16 and verse 33. I have said these things to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. First Peter chapter four and verse 12. Beloved, don't be surprised that the fiery trial that comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Here's what God's word says. Be ready. Dig those roots deep because something is going to happen in your life that will test your faith. You said, Brian, what are you, what are you suggesting today? Let me ask you today, is your faith strong enough to survive the loss of a job? An undeserved loss of a job. Is your faith strong enough to survive a broken relationship? Is it? Is your faith strong enough to, uh, to survive a difficult illness? Something that comes upon you suddenly and unexpectedly that, that you cannot explain? Is your faith strong enough to survive an unjust and untruthful accusation? Is your faith strong enough to survive the death of a child? Listen, we must have a strong foundation because there will come a time in our life when the very foundation of our life will be shaken. And if we do not hold on to something stronger than ourselves, we can fall. And even fall away from the Lord. We built um, um, our church in Mexico City. We bought this. We bought this piece of property. It's been, oh my word, 25 years ago now. We bought this piece of property, and our church was growing. And we we were growing so much that we had to knock out the back walls and build an auditorium. And then we had to Mexico City. You don't have a lot of land. We only had 300 square meters, so the only way to build was up. The church was growing. We couldn't build out. We had to build up. And so we brought architects in and we said, okay, what are we going to do to add a, another floor and potentially another floor on top of that? And so the architect said, well, man, we got to dig some pretty awesome and big foundations. We got to add to your foundation. And we're like, well, how much is that going to cost? <laughs> 
And it cost a lot of money. The guy said, you know what, you can build on top, but if you don't put those foundations in, you could be in trouble. Well, wisely, our church leadership said, man, let's, let's strengthen our foundation. So they dug down into, right in our auditorium, Vicky, you probably remember, right in our auditorium, dug way down and put these massive foundations in our building. And I remember looking at him sometimes thinking, asking the architect, man, this is overkill to me. Oh my word, we're putting in, I mean, we're not, we're not building, you know, the Eiffel Tower here. We're adding one floor. And so but they said, no, 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 believe me, you got to do it. So they built it. We added on beautiful church building. I'll never forget, one day I was in a restaurant in Mexico City and an earthquake hit. And, you know, one of those, if you've ever been to Mexico City, we have them occasionally, but one of those strong earthquakes. Building shook, I mean shook, scared everybody to death. You know, I'd like to think, you know, my faith was strong and I'm just standing up looking at everybody else, but I'm under the table, you know, you know, petrified, crying out to God for my life. And that's not really true. But, but anyway, so we went through this, went through this, this earthquake. And so soon as it settled, I looked, I had one of our church leaders with me across the table. As soon as it settled, I said, let's go. He said, where are we going? I said, we're going to the church. <laughs> I want to see how the church survived this earthquake. And man, we walked in, guess what? Not a crack in the walls. Not a block fell. The architect knew what he was talking about when he said, build a strong foundation. Jose and I were there this last November. They've added another floor, and only the Lord knows how many earthquakes they've been through, and that building is strong. Why? It's got a strong foundation. You will go through a test in your life that will shake you to your core, that will test the foundation of your faith. Let me give you a a second thing. The second thing is this. Here's the second application that I believe Jesus is saying. A faith that is not followed by obedience is a weak faith without a solid foundation. Let me say that again. A faith that is not followed by obedience is a weak faith Without a solid foundation. Verse 26. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. Listen, here's what Jesus is saying. Obedience is the result of faith. Let me say it again. Obedience is the result of faith. Let me say it one more time. Obedience is the result of faith. Let me, let me not, let's not listen to Brian's words. Let's listen to God's words. James chapter 2 and verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he does not have works? Can that faith save him? Don't misinterpret what James is saying. He's been misinterpreted for years. James is not saying that it's not faith that saves us, but worth works. That's not what he's saying. But here's what, here's what James is saying. A faith without works is a cheap faith. A faith that does not result in obedience is a weak faith. Notice verse 26 of that same chapter. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. James' words. Once again, he's not saying that we're saved by good works. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace are we saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. I get that. But Paul says in verse 10 of Ephesians 2, but we are saved for good works. In other words, when God comes into our life, he changes us. He begins to produce those good works in us. He who began a good work in us will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul says this, if anyone is in Christ, he is, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. And all things have become new. So in the light of that, what do we do? Let me give you two practical points. They're not in your notes. Two practical things. Number one, examine the foundation of your faith. My goal today is not to make you doubt your faith. Please catch that. That's not my purpose today. But I think it's important that we examine our faith. Paul even says, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Examine the foundation of your faith. 
But I would also say examine the focus of your faith. Listen, if you hear anything I say today, please catch this, all right? I am convinced that there are many believers today that are attempting to live the Christian life on their own power. They're focused. They're determined. They, they listen to Brian. They listen to, you know, Dr. Hill. They listen to whoever stands up here and speaks week after week. And they get this determination in themselves. They walk out of the building saying, okay, this week I'm going to do it. This week I'm going to live the Christian life. And by Wednesday, they're frustrated and discouraged. They, they were determined. They wanted to do right. They were even focused, but now they're frustrated and they're defeated. You say, Brian, how do you know that? Because I'm one of them. I'm one of them. Like the Apostle Paul. Listen, I confess that I do things that I shouldn't. And I confess, like Paul says in Romans chapter 7, that I don't do the things that I should. Listen, I get it. The Christian life is a paradox. The more I try, the more I strive, the more I fail. It is only when I give up and I give in to the power of God that I am able to be victorious. It's kind of like, and, and somebody's going to correct me, I'm sure. Years ago, Vicky and I went on this vacation and, and we went to this resort place and, and they said, hey, you ever water skied? And I'm like, no, nah, I've never water skied. You want to go water skiing? Sure, I want to go water skiing. I mean, I was how old? 28 years old back? I was a kid back then. I am thought, I've never water skied, but this has got to be a piece of cake, all right? I mean, if other people can do it, I can do it. And so we got out, and, you know, I grabbed a hold of the things, water skis. I think I, tr- I tried so hard to get up. After four or five times... I never got up on the skis. There were these little old ladies that I saw that were getting up and, you know, skiing all over the lake. Here's strong, robust Brian. And the guy that's driving the boat, I'm sure he's sitting back thinking, who is this wimpy guy in the back that just can't even get up? I had all the best intentions in the world. I tried, and he kept saying, Brian, just sit back and let, let the velocity, let everything kind of bring you up. If you just hold on. It'll bring you up yourself. And I'm trying. I'm trying to stand up. I never did it. I'm 54 years old. I've never water skied in my life, all right? I can't do it. Please don't invite me to try, all right? <laughs> I've already been a failure once. I'm not going to be a failure again, all right? All right, but, 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 but I think that's an explanation of our lives because we try under our own power and we fail. You say, Brian, how can I do it then? Let me give you just a couple of practical things. The first is this, and we're going to talk about this in the next few weeks. Accept the gift of righteousness of Jesus Christ. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Realize that you can never please God. You say, Brian, isn't the object of religion to please God? We say that, but you and I can never please God. I can can live for a thousand years, and I can never please God. My good works are just like filthy rags in his sight. The neat thing, though, accept this, embrace this, is I don't have to please God because Jesus already pleased him. I don't have to fulfill the law. Jesus already fulfilled the law. He lived the perfect life that I can never live. So every day I wake up and say, oh God, today I claim the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I cannot do this on my own, but I claim your righteousness for a victorious life. Surrender to the Holy Spirit of God. And ask him to produce obedience to God's word in your life. That's the only way Brian's ever going to be successful. That's the only way you're ever going to be successful. Let me give the last thing and I'm done. The foundation of your faith is not obedience or good works, but Jesus Christ. Jesus is the rock of your salvation. Would you say that with me today? Jesus is the rock of my salvation. Can you say it one more time? 
Jesus is the rock of my salvation. We used to sing the song with our kids. Jesus is the rock of my salvation. His banner over me is love. Jesus is the rock of my salvation. His banner over me is love. Some of you know the signs. You're doing it with me, all right? You've taught children's church at some point or you had kids. Listen, the foundation is not obedience. It's Jesus. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. Notice the words of the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 3.11. For no one can lay a foundation other other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2.6, for it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Here's the eye. Jesus is either the cornerstone of your life or he's the stumbling block of your life. He's either the foundation upon which your life is fixed or he's the stumbling stone. Why is that? Because one day you will stumble upon him and you will fall into destruction. Listen, I'm done. This is such an important point for us to realize. As we come to the end of it, remember the end of the sermon. Remember to whom Jesus is preaching. He's preaching to the scribes and Pharisees, the religious people of his day, people who took pride in obeying the commands. They were so prideful in obeying commands that they invented commands to obey. I mean, these were people who would say, listen, I got it together. I'm spiritual. I'm religious. God, I'm so thankful that I'm not like the heathen over there but I do what you want me to do. That's who Jesus is preaching this message to. And he looks and he says, the foundation is not your righteousness. The foundation is not your religiosity. The foundation is not your your ability to to do good works because you can never be good enough. Your foundation must be me. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. Let me ask you today, what are you building your life on? Day after day, what is your life being constructed upon? Is it on great aspirations? Is it on selfish ambition and desires? Or can you sit back and say, no man, I am building my life on Jesus Christ. And as a result, he is changing me. I'm not what I ought to be, to use that old adage, but thank God I'm not what I used to be because God is changing me for his honor and his glory. Build your life on a solid foundation. Make sure that foundation is Jesus.